At BLM, we are keen to make sure you understand what is involved in an inquest, and we are here to answer any questions you may have. Please watch the video which follows to find out more. We also provide further material for you to download and details will follow at the end of the video. If you have any questions, please do not hesitate to get in touch. Please watch our other videos in the What If series for further information on legal know-how for clinicians. Hello, my name is Paddy and this is my colleague Rachel. This video is intended to provide an overview of the inquest process as well as further information on how to approach these types of proceedings. I'll start by asking you, Rachel, what is an inquest? Well, Paddy, an inquest is essentially an inquiry following an unexplained death to establish who the deceased was, where and when they died, and finally how they died. Much of the evidence at an inquest will focus on establishing and answering that very final question, how? An inquest is a formal legal proceeding. It's conducted by a coroner, but it is different from a judicial court in that the aim is not to apportion blame or determine criminal or civil liability, but to establish the facts. The medical cause of death and the circumstances surrounding the death will also be considered. Let's discuss who will be present at an inquest and who will ask questions. Uh, let's start with the coroner. Well, inquests are almost always public and they're held in open court. A number of people will be present during an inquest and some of them will be entitled to ask questions. The coroner leads those proceedings though. To enable the coroner to establish answers to four questions, they will request and gather relevant documentation prior to the inquest. The coroner will also identify the interested persons or parties who have some involvement in the investigation or who may have the potential to be criticised in some way. Who are interested persons and why would they be in attendance? Interested persons are designated by the coroner. Uh, they are entitled to legal representation at the inquest. They're also entitled to disclosure of all the relevant material available to the coroner in advance. And they can also ask questions um, of the witnesses attending court and they often do that via their legal representatives. For reasons that will become clearer later, we recommend having an experienced legal representative with you if you are an interested person. Having somebody with you at the inquest to speak on your behalf and offer support and guidance is invaluable. Will the deceased family be present? Yes, members of the deceased family are entitled to be involved and they're usually given interested person status by the coroner. As the deceased family are classed as an interested person, they have the same rights to legal representation, questioning of witnesses and access to disclosure as the other interested persons do. Will there be other witnesses? Yes, uh, the coroner may require other witnesses to attend to establish the relevant facts surrounding the death and they may be police officers or medical or dental professionals who are involved in the care of the deceased. The coroner can also instruct an expert witness in order to assist with their inquiry. Should we expect the press to be there? As inquests are usually held in open court, the members of the public and the press do have a right to attend. If you are called to an inquest that does attract media attention, you may wish to contact your indemnity organisation or seek legal advice on whether to give a statement to the press or how to react if you are approached. What if the coroner asks for a statement or a report? Well, coroners investigate unexplained deaths and in order to do that, statements are requested from anyone who may be able to shed light on the relevant circumstances. And that is more likely in cases that involve medical or dental professionals who are involved in providing care to the deceased. The coroner will want to get a better understanding of the medical circumstances before the inquest to ascertain whether, say, correct guidance or procedures were followed or if an expert report is required. Statements are also disclosed to the other interested persons as well. The statement will set out the account of events, so it's absolutely essential it's done correctly, as a poorly worded statement can open new lines of inquiry, or it can result in very difficult or hostile questioning when giving oral evidence. So if you've been asked to provide a statement to the coroner, and you are, or suspect you may be an interested person, or even if you suspect you may be in difficulty yourself, it's really sensible to contact your indemnity organisation or seek legal advice straight away to assist in preparing your statement. Your statement lays the foundation of your involvement in the inquest and once submitted it's very difficult to distance yourself from what you have written. So it's crucial to ensure that your evidence is carefully considered and you really may well benefit from legal advice from the outset. 
What happens at the end of an inquest? Well, the coroner will set out his or her factual findings uh, after hearing all the evidence about who the deceased was, when and where they died, and the medical cause of death. The coroner then gives a conclusion, confirming how the deceased came by their death. And broadly speaking, there are nine types of conclusion. The most common are natural causes, accident, misadventure, suicide, unlawful killing, lawful killing, and an open conclusion. And they're examples of traditional short-form conclusions. But in cases where a short-form conclusion is not appropriate, say, for example, when death has occurred following medical or dental treatment, then a narrative conclusion can be returned. And that is a brief, neutral and factual statement which should not express any judgment or opinion. A neglect rider can be added if, on the balance of probabilities, there has been a gross failure to provide adequate nourishment, shelter, warmth or basic medical care to a person in a dependent position. That may be due to youth, incarceration, illness or age. However, for neglect to be established, there must be a clear and direct causal link between the conduct described as neglect and the cause of death. What is a Regulation 28 report? At the end of an inquest, the coroner may feel it necessary to make this Regulation 28 report. And it's a report made under Regulation 28 of the Coroner's Investigation Rules 2013. It's more frequently known as a Preventing Future Deaths report. The coroner may feel from the evidence heard that circumstances remain which create a risk of future deaths and steps need to be taken to prevent those circumstances which led to the death from happening again and re reduce the risk of death created by them. The coroner is under a legal obligation to do this if they feel it is necessary, but it is invariably directed at institutions rather than individuals, as it often involves the adequacy of systems or procedures. The coroner will state their concerns and reasons for preparing the report. The recipient is then under a duty to respond to the coroner within 56 days, unless that time is extended, setting out the action taken or proposed or to explain why no action is proposed. The report will then be sent to the Chief Coroner and any other persons the coroner considers appropriate, and that can include professional regulators such as the GMC or GDC. The Chief Coroner is also entitled to publish a copy of the summary of report if they so wish. What about a paragraph 37 letter? Well, this happens where a duty to make a preventing future death report does not arise, but the coroner wishes to draw attention to a matter of concern which has arisen during the inquest. And the coroner may choose to write a letter expressing that concern to the relevant person or organisation. It's known as a paragraph 37 letter. For example, the matter in question may not relate to a risk of future deaths. The coroner may discuss the matter with the interested persons and the correspondence may be copied to them. What is an Article 2 inquest and how does it differ to a normal inquest? Well, Article 2 refers to the Euro European Convention of Human Rights, which states that everyone's right to life shall be protected by law and no one shall be deprived of his life intentionally, save in the execution of a sentence for court, following his conviction of a crime for which the penalty is provided by law. In a traditional inquest, the coroner is limited to establishing who the deceased was, where and when they died, and to a limited extent, how the deceased came by their death. And the how in this context is limited to by what means the deceased came by their death. However, in an inquest where the coroner has decided that Article 2 is engaged, sometimes referred to as a Middleton inquest, the scope of how the deceased came by their death is expanded. This means the coroner looks beyond by what means and can include in what circumstances. Now on the face of it, there may not seem to be a huge difference between the two, but there is. The Article 2 inquest permits the coroner to investigate the wider circumstances of a death and this can have wide-reaching consequences for the interested persons. Coroners can also deal with issues of liability, sometimes criminal liability, which can be particularly troublesome for a practitioner who is an interested person. It allows the deceased family to ask a greater range of questions of witnesses which can lead to civil claims. It's most certainly advisable to contact your indemnity organisation or seek legal advice if you're notified that you're an interested person in an Article 2 inquest or the question of whether Article 2 is engaged arises. Will there be a jury? Well, only a senior coroner is actually able to impanel a jury, but the views of the deceased family will often be taken into account. 
Uh, there are a number of circumstances which can trigger this, but a senior coroner has a general discretion to summon a jury if they feel there is sufficient reason for doing so. Now clearly this is a wide discretion, but it's generally accepted that Article 2 inquests or high profile cases will often trigger the increased scrutiny that a jury inquest supposedly brings. We hope you found our video informative. To download further material, please visit the link on the screen now or contact a member of the team. Thank you.